Uh, good afternoon. We could, yeah. uh, good afternoon. I want to thank all of you for, for being here today. I particularly want to thank uh, Congresswoman Nancy Pelosi, uh, who has uh, just done so much on this issue, and publicly just say how much of that I appreciate her effort, and also Congressman Charlie Rose, who has also done so much on this issue. I appreciate them both, and Congressman Smith, who, who was here today, who was here, who was with me when we visited China. Most importantly, I want to thank Harry Wu for his tireless research in what he literally risked his life to bring this uh, information out. Harry, as many of you know, spent 19 years, 19 years as a slave laborer in China's gulag, known as a lega. It's gulag, these are like gulags in the Soviet Union. I was in Perm Camp 35, the last gulag in the Soviet Union. These are gulags, uh, basically. His crime, Harry's crime, was speaking out in support of freedom. Because of the courageous efforts of Harry Wu and others, we now have conclusive proof that the Chinese government continues to export products made in Chinese slave labor prisons. Those who believe that the collapse of the Soviet Union brought an end to forced labor in gulag-style prisons are quite mistaken. I know firsthand that the system is alive and flourishing in China. In 1991, I visited Beijing prison, number one, with Congressman Smith, with the hopes of meeting some of the pro-democracy demonstrators who were in prison as a result of Tiananmen Square. There were 40 Tiananmen Square demonstrators in Beijing prison, number one, the day that we went in there. We were not allowed to see the demonstrators, but we did find an active prison industry where workers toiled in unsafe conditions to manufacture socks and other textile products and jelly shoes later determined for export outside of China. China now enjoys an $18 billion trade surplus with the United States. And Chinese leaders in the past have boasted that the system generates at least $100 million a year in exports. But do not misunderstand. This is fundamentally a moral issue, not an economic one. Whether the Chinese government is making $100 million or $1 exporting these goods, it is immoral for the United States to prop up this immune, inhumane system. In fact, the Chinese have become quite sophisticated in their efforts to export these slave labor-made goods. They set up front companies, change product names, and ship the goods via Hong Kong to hide the fact that the goods are made by prisoners, many of them democratic people who just want democracy and to speak out for freedom. Harry will also present information that Chinese are even actively recruiting unsuspecting Americans to invest in their slave labor factories. The timing of the release of this shocking information comes as the Clinton administration prepares to send to Congress its request to renew MFN for China. This new information is not designed to embarrass the, uh, the president. But let me just say, as a Republican member, I strongly oppose what President Bush did for all the time when he was president and voted against him every single time on the MF question, MFN, working with Nancy Pelosi. But it is my hope that it will force the administration to rethink its request for renewal of, of most favored nation trading status for China without very strict conditions on MFN, including 100 percent adherence to the Memorandum of Understanding signed with the U.S. last year. MFN should be denied. In fact, if Congress passes the Pelosi MFN bill, which I support, President Clinton must certify that the Chinese are not engaged in the export of slave labor made goods. And frankly, the best thing for the administration to do would be to take the Pelosi bill and put that in executive order, if that's what they're going to do with regard to executive order. Now we have concrete proof that not only is the government of China exporting to America slave labor made goods, but that a number of American companies may knowingly, may knowingly import these goods in violation of U.S. law. Apparently some American businesses value high profits more than they value fundamental human rights. Congress has put real teeth in our laws prohibiting the importation of slave labor made goods. Legislation which Congresswoman Pelosi and I worked on last year 
and what's passed the Congress last year in the Treasury Appropriation Bill is now law which substantially increases the penalty to $50,000 against American companies and individuals who knowingly import slave labor made good. Still, the Chinese are playing a complex shell game which makes identifying slave labor made good similar to finding a needle in a haystack. I do not want to unfairly criticize the Customs Service, which has the difficult task of stopping slave labor goods from entering America. Since last fall, Customs has requested access to five prisons suspected of exporting slave labor made goods. Unfortunately, four of Customs' five requests were denied by the Chinese. The only prison allowed to be visited, the Jinma Diesel Engine Facility, was made mostly off-limits for inspection. The report, which Harry will release today, concludes that the Jimmy plant is still, is still producing and exporting slave labor-made diesels. I say to the government in Beijing, if you have nothing to hide, then allow Customs unlimited access to the prison. Customs just got a new director in the last several days, and that new director has an obligation to be very, very aggressive since the Congress has spoken on this issue so many times. I'm also today calling on Attorney General Janet Reno to make the prosecution of this crime a priority for the Clinton administration. I urge Ms. Reno to create a special task force within the Department of Justice to work hand in hand with the Customs Service to bring an end to the importation of slave labor made goods, which could successfully prosecute those guilty of importing slave labor goods. Based upon the credible information which is being made available here today, I also call on the Clinton administration to reassess its position on MFN to allow the Chinese to continue to export to the U.S. goods made in these dismal prisons by innocent people, many whose only crime is they stand for freedom, cuts against the grain of what our nation stands for. Now let me just now uh, turn this over to uh, Cong Congresswoman, Rose, uh, uh, Congressman Rose and then Congresswoman Pelosi if she wants to and Congressman Smith if he wants to make a comment. And lastly, uh, Harry and Jeff will go in and explain the de details. Charlie? The principles of democracy that we seek to impose on places like the former Soviet Union seem to go out the window when American businesses smell a marketplace to exploit. And that's clearly what has happened in this city and in this country with dozens of large American corporations writing the president from their lobby group in downtown Washington suggesting that there should be no conditions on MFN with China. I'm embarrassed at the list of U.S. companies who are asking the president of the United States to turn his back on the kinds of atrocities that Harry Wu will, in more graphic detail, reveal to you today. China is either at your feet or they're at your throat. And I'm telling you, it's time to get them at our feet and either don't pass MFN or make sure that it is so heavily conditioned that these kind of atrocities never happen again. We tell our friends in Russia and the former states of the Soviet Union that they must adopt democratic self-government before they can be a full market country. Yet, how, how can we possibly ignore, and the world can ignore, the double standard that we show by even considering granting MFN to the People's Republic of China? Harry Wu has done us a great service. I support what he has accomplished. I'm proud to be a co-sponsor of uh, the Pelosi bill. Uh, the, my predecessor at this microphone is absolutely correct. That bill should be adopted as the condition for MFN. I hope that you will tell everyone what you see here today. Thank you very much. My name is Nancy Pelosi, and I'm proud to stand here with my <coughs> colleagues, Charlie Rose, who has to go back to chair his own committee. He is a champion in the Congress of the United States on human rights. No one has done more uh, in the Congress and in the country on the issue of Tibet uh, in terms of uh, ceasing to threaten the uh, culture of Tibet as a condition uh, for renewal of MFN. And my friend, whom I serve on appropriations with, Frank Wolf, there is, prisoners of conscience throughout the world should know 
that no matter what the political situation or the economic situation, this member of Congress does not rest as long as any of them are forced uh, to be in prison because of what they believe and how they worship. Today is very important because Harry Wu, as you know, is a very courageous person. And at this time, he's come out of China with some very important information. I know that's why you're here. Just want to put it in perspective for a moment. A year ago, nearly a year ago, uh, the U.S. and China negotiated a memorandum of understanding about uh, exportation of prison labor. As you know, or should know, it's against the law for U.S. to receive imports which are made by prison labor in any country. Because of the pressure from MFN, et cetera, the Chinese uh, agreed to this memorandum of understanding. My response when I saw the memorandum of understanding was that it was a victory for the Chinese government. First of all, because it was a memorandum of understanding on prison labor, and what we're talking about here is forced labor. We're talking not about criminals going to jail uh, uh, who are tried for an offense, a, a, um, a crime. We're talking about people who are in jail because of their beliefs. And that, um, that is a double edge, as, as Frank said. It's a, it's a moral issue as well as an economic issue. So why we're here today is to say, despite that memorandum of understanding and despite the representation that the Chinese government makes, that it is not its policy uh, to uh, have goods exported, uh, prison-made goods for export. In fact, prison-made goods are being exported. And it's, I'm so pleased that so many of you are here to shed the bright light of this meeting and this country on this uh, violation of our trade rep, uh, relationship as well as uh, on the violation of human rights. So I'm proud to stand with my colleagues, and I'm proud to stand here with Harry Wu. And I, like you, am very interested in seeing his presentation uh, today. I, I know what it contains, but I'm interested to see your reaction to it as well. It would be a cruel hoax, I think, to the American people to think that we fought the Cold War, not only about our own national security, but also about freedom. And now the, the argument is coming down to freedom, I'll, except if a country has cheap labor, and access to markets of goods made in that country, not necessarily made by uh, American workers, uh, then all that we've said about freedom goes out the window. With that, I'm pleased to pass on the baton to my colleague, Christopher Smith of New Jersey. Thank you, Nancy. Very briefly, human rights are indivisible. And when a person's human rights are violated, it behooves, particularly in a free nation like our own, to speak out very loud and clear that those kinds of abuses will not be tolerated. In China today, abuses abound in the area of religious repression, uh, the use of forced and coerced abortion and involuntary sterilization, the crackdown that continues on those who were involved with the Tiananmen Square uh, outpourings when people sought, unfortunately were denied, basic uh, principles of democracy and freedom, the right to speak and to assemble as they saw fit. And today we focus on that very important issue of the use of forced labor and the manufacture of goods that are then exported to, point, uh, to free nations like ourselves and then sold in our retail outlets. As Frank Wolf indicated earlier, we were in uh, Beijing in March of 1991. We got into prison, uh, Beijing prison number one, and while there brought out some socks that had been manufactured by the inmates, uh, 40 of whom were, were incarcerated simply because they demonstrated uh, at Tiananmen Square for freedom and for democracy. Uh, as Frank pointed out, we sought to meet with them, to discuss uh, issues with them. Unfortunately, we were denied. But the point was, when we brought back this, these socks and had them analyzed to find out whether or not they were making their way to our own shores, subsequent to that, the importation of those socks were banned. The problem has always been proof of origin. There was no denying that we had picked up these socks when we were in that particular location and then we could verify that they indeed uh, had been produced by, by slave labor. Harry Wu has risked his life again. He is a man who speaks with great moral authority, like Sharansky in the Soviet Union, like uh, others who have spent time in prison camps. He brings to bear on this issue his own personal sacrifice and courage, and I think it behooves all of us to listen very carefully to the information that he has provided us, and I do hope and this is a nonpartisan issue, because like Mr. Wolf, I disagreed with former President Bush as well in terms of his position on MFN and China. I hope this administration is listening and listening carefully to what Harry Wu has to say. Harry. 
Rose. My name is Henry Wolf, ladies and gentlemen. Nearly two years ago, the world began to learn the full extent of Chinese log cam system. Newsweek and 60 Minutes both reported in detail about how the forced labor products were being exported to the world and also including the United States. Chinese officials denied it immediately. And scarcely a month ago, Chinese State Council itself issued a decree report and denied again. Today, we stand before you to present new evidence that the Chinese government has always lied about the log products. They are lying still. Chinese government officials, officials have not only lied to the world, but they have made an extraordinary effort to hide the continued export of enslaved labor products to the United States. When you hear our presentation today and read our report, I urge you to remember that, that, that the Chinese gulag, the Lao Gai, has existed for more than 40 years. At least 50 million people have been thrown in it, and many never be heard from again. Today, more than 10 million are still locked away. The Chinese force all of them to labor. They force all to undergo throw reform, whatever you call brainwashing. It is not enough to release a few well-known dissidents at a time. The assistance, existence of the law guy itself is one of the most critical human rights issues in our time. The law guy contains millions of unknown people whose suffering is intolerable. The export of forced labor products represents only one dimension of this tool of the dictatorship. It is important. The foreign exchange earned by the Lao Gai allows it to continue and even expand. Buying Lao Gai products directly denies people their human rights. We hope our work will get the world closer to answers for such questions as why are people forced to labor? What is the system which enslaves them? How many are there and where are they? We are not going to discuss the merits of the economic development or its relationship to the political change. We are talking today only about the Lao Gai. We believe in a simple truth. Democracy cannot exist in China as long as the Lao Gai system exists. We say to the American people, please don't buy blood. Please don't buy tears. My fellow director, Jeff Fiedler, will now brief you on our report, and we will take you any question. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. You all have the report. I'm not going to go through it. Uh, I'm going to lead you through the basic facts, case at a time, and relatively quickly. The first case has to do with Zhejiang province and the largest hoist factory in China, which is a prison. You see on this map, which we got out of the Yuhang County yearbook, which is an official Chinese government publication, the village of Linping, or the town of Linping. Hangzhou Wulin Machinery Works, otherwise known as Zhejiang Province Number 4 Prison, is just outside of the center of town. This is the largest hoist factory in China. It is one of the first 28 companies in the country to receive direct governmental export authority. They have to go through no one. A prison journal 
Nebu Prison Journal, an internal prison journal read by other prison officials, discusses both Wu Lin, as we will call the prison, and another prison called Wu Yi, meaning May 1st, in another part of Zhejiang province, which I'll explain in more detail later, exports to 58 countries. In 1990, Wu Lin received the Gold Medal Award, one of the, I believe, 60 or 70 Gold Medal Awards issued that year by the central government, a state prize-winning award. <clears throat> we conducted business with a subsidiary of a Chinese state-owned corporation in Hong Kong. The name of that corporation is Fuchuan. You'll see it in your... Uh, see it in your report. Among the things that Fuchuan said to us was, no, they wouldn't sell us products from Wu Lin because there was a sole agent in the United States for those products, Wu Lin being Zhejiang number four prison. So I, uh, we sent a fax back and said, okay, tell us who it is because so, it's our competition and what the price they have is. Next thing, we received the cable. That was our first shock. Cable said that the sole agent in the United States for Wu Lin, otherwise known as Hangzhou Super Power Hoist, is a company called CM. And the brand that they have on their products is CM brand. When we looked up CM, we learned it was a company called Columbus McKinnon in Amherst, New York. Now, let me do it from here first. These are photographs of CM products, chain hoist. The, the circular hoist is a chain hoist. This is what's called a lever hoist. They're both hoists, right? They lift things, heavy weight. Both were made in Wu Lin, Zhejiang Number no. 4 prison. We purchased them in Baltimore at the direction of CM. We called them up and asked them where we could buy it. They told us four locations in Baltimore. We bought it in one. I would point out to you that the two hoists in the center, Harry, if you'd turn that around, uh, turn it around so you could see. The two hoists in the center, one on the right is a CM brand hoist. The one on the left is what is known as a flying pigeon brand hoist. It won the state prize in 1990. It is made in Zhejiang number no. four prison, Wu Lin. If you would examine both hoists carefully, you would find little, if any, difference. They are the same. They are manufactured in Zhejiang province number no. four prison, a Lao guy. For your information, the, the hoist to the left is a twin pigeon hoist made in the Wu Yi prison. Wu Yi prison, uh, actually Wu Yi light lifting works. It's also known as Zhejiang province number one prison. Both of those hoists we purchased in Hong Kong and had one was brought back by us, the other was shipped back to us. And the far left, uh, far right hoist to you is the lever hoist by CM also made in the prison. Now, Those are the facts. Zhejiang number four prison, Columbus McKinnon has been in there for an unknown number of years. They're still there. And we have uh, turned this information over to the US Customs Service. Uh, let me just, one, one thing. The Wu Lin prison, his name has been changed for external purposes to Hangzhou Super Power Hoist. One of our associates took a picture recently this is a new building, a new entrance to the prison. You will see here a public security bureau vehicle. That's the uh, internal police vehicle right in the parking lot. Um, OK, I'm going to move on to Jingma. But uh, we don't have the photographs of Jingma. Representative Wolf mentioned the Jingma diesel engines, which were seized in, in November of 1991 by the US Customs Service from a company called China Diesel Imports. Uh, CDI in San Diego. And, and there's subsequently been a detention order issued by the Customs Service banning those products. 
On March 28, 1993, Harry visited a trade show in Los Angeles, California, during which he spoke to a representative on the trade delegation who gave him a brochure, which he's showing you pictures from now, still trying to sell the Jingma diesel engine in the United States. And then, to add insult to injury, he requested foreign investment in the Jingma factory, which is known as Yunnan Prison Number 1. I will move farther north now to Laogai Boulevard. To the northern, northeastern town of Shenyang, which is in Liaoning province. There is a street there called Dongmei, da Dongmei Damalu in Chinese, what we have taken to calling it Laogai Boulevard. On this street are at least five major pr prisons, five Laogai camps, Reform to Labor and Reform to Education camps. The picture you see here is the west wall of Shenyang Laogai number one, I believe. One, I get my numbers wrong. This is another picture of the west wall. This wall alone is a, is a thousand meters long on four sides each. It's another picture of a guard tower taking under an overpass. This is on the very corner of the south and western corners. Another picture of that same tower. And this is the, we uh, the west wall again. Closer up, there's a a gate. There are three tiny side streets off of Longay Boulevard called New Life Lane 1, 2, and 3, Xinsheng. This is a photograph of the street sign. Each of the three leads to a different entrance of the prison. The prison that this leads to makes nine million pairs of rubber boots. I will get to that in a moment. Now I will take you down Dongbei Damalu or Laogai Boulevard to a 500,000 square meter Laogai, a prison. In night, these photographs represent two pages, and then we've taken some blow-ups, from the 1989 Liaoning Province Statistical and Economic Yearbook. I'll start you over to the left or actually the far bottom here. You see a model of the factory. If you look at it closely, you will count 11 guard towers. Take you up. You see two men. The man on the left is the factory director. The man on the right is the party committee director for, that, for, the, for the plant of the prison. Notice the same two characters in prison officials uniforms. They made this easy for us. Now, this place produces 50% of China's rubber processing vulcanizing accelerator chemicals. Not 50% of the towns, 50% of the country. This is not in one source, but in two or three sources. Matter of fact, they've gone from 35 to 50% over the last five or six years. Also on the page, just above the chemicals, you will see a group of men, two of whom are more interesting than the, actually three of whom are more interesting than the others. Our familiar face of the factory director, and standing next to him is a Caucasian whose name we do not know yet. Part of your work. Standing next to him is a Chinese male in clothing quite unlike the others. We believe that he is an, also an executive of the business firm visiting. The caption of the <coughs> on the, in the Chinese reads, a photograph of talks with some foreign businessmen, parentheses, American Dow Chemical Company Limited. Dow Chemical has a subsidiary in Hong Kong known as Dow Chemical Pacific Limited, three offices in China. 
and we think that they have more than a little explaining to do and why they were present. We do not know what kind of business they were doing. We do not know if they were buying. We don't know if they were selling. All we know is that they were there, according to the official Chinese publications. And I think it's only fair that they offer the rest of the world an explanation of why. Now, I'll take you back down Dongbei Damalu, and still in that 1990, I mean 1989, Liaoning Statistical Yearbook, to back to the rubber factory. <clears throat> Notice the two men in uniform here, and in fact, one of the women is in uniform, walking down the steps. This actually I saw myself down Xinxiang Lane number two, I believe. They produce nine million, this is the entrance. It's a tight shot because if you widen the shot, you'd see the prison wall. Also on this page in the book are a bunch of boots produced by the prison. By the way, the China Product Annual from 1990 states for a couple of categories of boots, one category, 87% are exported, another category, 84% are exported, nine million pairs total, that's what they look like in the Chinese publication. We have run around various places in the United States and bought boots that look the same. We are not saying that these are the same boots. We are raising the question of the origin of these and other boots. There are shipping records that we have access to that indicate that upwards of 900,000 pounds of rubber boots alone were shipped out of the port of Dalian, which is the port five hours south of Shenyang and the northernmost port and the busiest port for these products, to the United States. From Dalian to the United States, 900,000 pounds of rubber boots. Not 900,000 pounds of rubber and rubber-related products. Now, what are the implications of those two things at the moment? The implications, in our view, are staggering. Back to the chemicals a second. 50% of the nation's rubber vulcanizing accelerators produced in a prison. If you are linear and conservative in your thinking and progression, half of the rubber in the country is produced by these chemicals. Maybe more, maybe less. Significant amount. Under US law, it is illegal to import anything manufactured by forced or convict labor made in whole or in part we would maintain to you that in part is rubber vulcanizing accelerators, and we will maintain the same thing with the US Customs Service. Let me take you back to Yuhan County a second and the map. I passed over it in the first go round. In the second, I would point you just to the left of Wu Lin in Zhejiang prison number four and you will find Xinjiang Hardware Tool Factory, otherwise known as Zhejiang Province Number no. 2 prison. There are made diamond brand hand tools, no brand hand tools, and whatever brand hand tools you want, according to documentation that you'll see in the report. This is a diamond brand what I call crescent wrench is also known as an adjustable wrench that we have bought here in the United States. And this is a no brand made in China. We're not saying these came from the prison yet. What you will also see in the report is that diamond brand hand tools are produced by legitimate factories in China, non-forced labor factories. This creates the following problem. You take forced labor products, mix them with legal products, throw them on in a container, and ship them to the United States and say, see if you can find it. It presents virtually an impossible problem for law enforcement authorities in the United States to discern which is the forced labor product and which is not. In our discussions of, with uh, companies in Hong Kong and continuing operations that we have going, we have more than strong indications that these products are coming in to the United States still.